Islamic Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization, and a proud member of the Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington. As a representative of my university, I start by acknowledging the Coast Salish people's original custodianship of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first public talk by Dr. Brendan Goldman during his term as the Strom Center's Hazel D. Cole Fellow. The Cole Fellowship is a two-year in-residence fellowship that supports a rising scholar in Jewish studies, a doctoral or postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington here in Seattle. The fellowship is named for Hazel D. Cole, who was an active participant in the Seattle Jewish community. Cole's sister and brother-in-law, Althea Stroom and Samuel Stroom, established the Hazel D. Cole Fellowship at the University of Washington in her memory in 1991. Past fellows include recent Strom lecturer, Marina Rustau, and the scholar of Ottoman Turkish Jewry, Maureen Jackson, among others. I'm very pleased to welcome Joyce Rifkin and her family here in the audience today. Joyce is Miss Hazel Cole's daughter. Joyce, we are so happy to have you here today. So let me introduce our speaker today. Dr. Brendan Goldman is a historian of the Jewish communities of the medieval Islamic world and a specialist in the documents of the Cairo Geniza. He received his PhD in history from the John Hopkins University in 2018 and joins us after serving for two years from 2018 to 2020 as postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University. Dr. Goldman's first book, uh, quote, the title is Camps of the Uncircumcised, the Cairo Geniza and Jewish Life in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, is set to be published by the University of Pennsylvania Press later this year, 2021. During his time here at the University of Washington, uh, Dr. Goldman is working on his second book project tentatively titled A Disciplinary Society, Medieval Prisons Through Jewish Eyes, the year 1000 to 1300. He has also been leading here while uh, during his time here at the Strom Center, the Minorities and Carceral Studies reading group with our other fellow Smadar Ben Natan and is teaching a course on queer pre-modernities next quarter. And I'm told in the fall, he's teaching an honor seminar on global histories of incarceration. So with that, I'd like to start the, the talk. Hi, my name is Brendan Goldman and I am the Hazel D. Cole Postdoctoral Fellow in Jewish Studies at the Strom Center. The University of Washington in Seattle. It is my pleasure to uh, give the annual Cole Fellow talk this year on minorities and state violence, the view from the Jews of medieval Cairo. America has recently come face to face with the reality that it is impossible to understand our own state and society without considering the voices of minorities and the marginalized. Inequalities in our legal and carceral systems that favor white Americans over others are not incidental. They are constitutive, embodying the anxieties and prejudices of the privileged members of the society which they serve. Today in America, scholars are utilizing the voices of people of color to infinitely enrich our understandings of the genesis of US penal institutions. For the pre-modern Christian and Islamic worlds, Jewish documents can provide a similar service, revealing how state violence maintains social hierarchies, often at the cost of minority lives and livelihoods. American Jews today occupy a position of unprecedented privilege in their people's history. However, before Western societies became increasingly sec secularized and embraced the invention of race, that is the notion that pigmentation should be a or the defining variable for constructing social hierarchies. Most pre-modern societies categorized religion in addition to gender and class as the most salient variable for determining in and out groups. In the medieval and early modern worlds, Jews, by nature of having no state of their own, were always of the out. That does not mean, of course, that there were not wealthy and powerful Jews. Jewish courtiers exercised control over massive armies and large treasuries on behalf of Christian and Muslim kings. Jews made fortunes as merchants and moneylenders. But Jewish power was always contingent on the goodwill of both the Jews, Muslim or Christian sovereigns, as well as their non-Jewish neighbors, on numerous occasions, when powerful Jews crossed their kings or the sentiments of the non-Jewish majority, they fell from power, often spectacularly and at the cost of the lives of members of their broader community. But the specter of state violence did not only or even primarily 
impact elite Jews. Patricia Krona, in her book, Pre-Industrial Societies, identifies the three basic prerogatives of pre-modern states. Those are taxation, the maintenance of social order, and the upkeep of an army to protect state subjects from foreign powers. What the sociologist Max Weber called legitimate, that is state-sanctioned violence, is integral to every one of these roles. In the pre-modern world, as in the modern one, minorities were often the primary victims of such state violence. Pre-modern states tax minorities at much higher rates than their neighbors and severely punished minority subjects who attempted to usurp rights reserved for the favored majority. These states arrested, enslaved, and executed minorities who insulted the majority's religion. Such systemic violence also underlay the relationship between medieval Islamic states and their dhimmi, that is non-Muslim subjects. The documents of the Cairo Geniza reveal the integral role that the police, prisons, and popular violence played in this relationship. What is the Cairo Geniza? The Cairo Geniza was a storage room for discarded manuscripts located in, in the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat, now called Old Cairo, Egypt. The Jewish tradition of depositing in a ritualized manner, texts carrying the name of God, subsequently burying them, has roots going back to at least late antiquity. The Jews of the Ben Ezra synagogue deposited not only texts with God's name on them, but also those of a seemingly secular nature. Even more fortuitously, the Ben Ezra congregants did not empty the, context, uh, the contents of their Geniza for burial. Therefore, when European scholars came upon the Cairo Geniza, the end of the 19th century, the storage room held roughly 400,000 folio pages. Of those pages, approximately 40,000 are documents of everyday life, including public and private letters, shopping lists, recipes, children's writing exercises, state documents, court documents, and rabbinic responsa. This is a uh, artistic rendering of what the um, Ben Ezra synagogue would have looked like and uh, what the Geniza uh, process of um, discarding manuscripts in the Geniza would have appeared to be. Uh, and um, these are examples of the types of documents that are found in the Geniza. This is a uh, page from a children's uh, writing exercise book for those who know the Hebrew al alphabet. You can see this is a primer um, for learning to um, write Hebrew. And uh, this is an example pertinent to our discussion today of um, uh, a different kind of document. There are Arabic script petitions, letters, and decrees that were written or repurposed by Jews. This particular one seemingly has nothing to do with Jews, but it survives in the Geniza um, because of uh, a Jew who repurposed it uh, as a Hebrew document. Now, most of the documents are written in Judeo-Arabic, a dialect of Middle Arabic written in Hebrew script, and most date to the period from 1000 to 1250. It is hard to overstate the value of the Geniza documents for understanding almost every facet of medieval Near Eastern states and societies. Geniza documents are what scholars call ephemera, that is, they are texts that were never intended to be read by future generations. By contrast, most pre-modern history is known only through literary documents intended for posterity, like the Chronicles of Kings, the Tales of Travel Writers, and the biographical dictionaries of societal elites. The Geniza is by far the largest single documentary cache of its kind, that is, a, doc a cache of uh, documents of everyday life um, from the medieval Islamic Near East. Now, Geniza documents do have their own biases towards literate men, but they, do, they also provide glimpses of the experiences of women, the poor, and the illiterate even if the latter's voices are often mediated by elite male scribes. Today we will explore how Jews in medieval Egypt experienced state violence in three spheres. Interactions with the police, subjection to imprisonment, house arrest and torture, and experiences of state-sanctioned or state-permitted acts of popular anti-Jewish violence. I will provide a representative sampling of stories I've culled from a corpus of over 200 Geniza documents that I've compiled involving state violence from the perspective of its Jewish victims. Now, while most of the figures I will discuss today are Jews, there is very little reason to think that Christians, who constituted an even larger minority in Egypt's population, at least in non-urban contexts, would have experienced state violence uh, differently. The Geniza documents allow us to see the ways that the penal state shaped the daily lives of Egyptian subjects, as well as the unique burden the system imposed on non-Muslims. One note before I begin. 
there is a tendency in both the popular imagination and scholarly literature to portray the pre-modern Islamic world as either exceptionally oppressive or exceptionally tolerant of minorities. Both of these positions can only be, and are, based on gross oversimplifications. Islam is a religion whose followers have included thousands of rulers, reigning over hundreds of states, across a period of more than 1400 years. In some times and places, Jews and Christians thrived under Islam. In others, they were persecuted, expelled, or massacred. The same is true, of course, of Jewish life in Christian contexts. With such a massive and contradictory set of data, the question of whether Jewish life was better under Christian or Muslim sovereigns is best left to polemicists, apologists, and politicians. It is not the domain of scholars. What we can say is that Egypt during the middle, high Middle Ages, for our purposes 1000 to 1250 CE, was, according to most experts, a relatively good place to be a Jew. My talk today does not necessarily dispute that assumption. Rather, I would argue that the fact that minorities endured abuses on the scale and the frequency documented here in a relatively tolerant society indicates the extent to which such violence was likely endemic to minority state relations in other pre-modern contexts, where no corpus like the Geniza survives that could illuminate such uses of state violence. My talk today also should not be interpreted as suggesting that the medieval world was an exceptionally cruel, dark, or intolerant place. Medieval people could not have imagined slaughter on the scale of the Nazi Holocaust, the Stalinist terror famines, or the Maoist Cultural Revolution of the 20th century. If cruelty and intolerances are our standards, we moderns have proven far more medieval in the pejorative sense of that word than the people living in the Middle Ages. However, even the most tolerant medieval Muslim or Christian sovereign would never have imagined granting equal rights for those outside their own religious groups. Medieval rulers believed that God gave them their crowns in order to rule as Christian or Muslim kings. In other words, God wanted them and other members of their faith, the true faith, to be in charge. Therefore, to relinquish too much power to followers of false faiths, much less to grant them equal rights, would not have been an act of principle, but one of sacrilege. As such, while medieval states uh, committed violence against minorities that often resembles our own, medieval states and societies did not indulge in the type of self-serving apologetics we have used to justify systemic prejudice in our own institutions. We begin today with a discussion of law enforcement in medieval Egypt. Now in America today, several law enforcement agencies monitor our population, including the police, the FBI, the DEA, et cetera. There's some clarity to the prerogatives of these organizations. For instance, the DEA will deal with illicit drugs. There are also many scenarios in which these institutions' responsibilities overlap. Similarly, in medieval Egypt, there were several institutions that enforced the law. However, unlike in our own day, a single institution, that of the shorta, was predominant in this context. The Arabic word shorta is often translated as simply the police. But as my colleague Muhammad al lahbi has demonstrated, the, shor the shorta's prerogative extended well beyond modern day conceptions of policing. Depending on the context, the shorta could serve as urban tax collectors, think of IRS agents with swords, judges with their own courts, inquisitors preventing the defamation perversion of Islam, and bailiffs who enforced warrants of arrest from Qadis, that is, Muslim judges. In the Geniza, we never see officers of the Shorta as such, but we do see the Sahaba Shorta, the head of the Shorta, a powerful figure who orders arrests, seizes property, maintains his own court and prisons, and so on. In a few merchant letters, a Sahaba Shorta known to be friendly to Jews also appears. The merchants send their regards to this figure, and invoke his help in navigating the tax system. In other documents, especially from smaller cities, the office of Sahab Ashorta clearly falls among the prerogatives of the Wali, the governor of a town or region. Under the Sahab Ashorta were also various other offices that I've listed here. The Shorta stood in an uneasy relationship with Qadis, 
Muslim judges who in theory had prerogatives to adjudicate all violations of Islamic law, but whose role in criminal law specifically was often contingent on the support of the shorta. Even more strange from the shorta were the ulama and the fuqaha, Islamic scholars and jurists who frequently condemned the shorta for ignoring the sharia, that is Islamic law. The shorta, on the other hand, saw themselves as enforcing siyasa, often translated as the law of statecraft, and as upholders of haiba, reverential awe for the state and its sovereign. A parallel secret police force functioned under a different office, the Sahab al-Habr, the Sahab al barid Literally, the latter means the head of the post and the former the head of information. Now, the secret police appear in a half dozen documents dealing with cases involving sexual immorality, a Jew sleeping with a Muslim woman, tax evasion, a Jew defaming Islam, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, sorry, tax evasion and a Jew defaming Islam. The secret police worked with other state officials, including Qadis and the Sahaba Shorta, as those institutions' eyes and ears, expanding the state's capacity for observation and thus for regulating minorities' behaviors. Other offices who had law enforcement prerogatives also appear in the documents, including the Mukhtasib, the market regulator, a figure that we will discuss later on today. Now that I've sketch the various law enforcement institutions and their prerogatives, we can turn to the actual documents. Our first, our first document is a typical rabbinic court testimony that captures the various tactics that the Shorta used against lawbreakers. It describes how a group of Jews placed a harem, a ban of excommunication against another Jew named Abu Khair in the synagogue in Fustat. Abu Khair then excommunicated the excommunicators. This is actually not that uncommon in the um, medieval world in all three monotheistic communities. Now, among those Abu Khair excommunicated was a Jew named Yehuda ben Chaim. Yehuda then confronted Abu Khair in the streets of Fustat, and uh, they got into a brawling match. This document, by the way, as you can see, is uh, this is a court testimony, um, and uh, at the bottom we see the start of um, a set of signatures that would have been um, part of any uh, legal deed of this type. We learn that after Yehuda um, confronted Abu Khair in the streets of Fustat, Several nights later, runners uh, came down from Cairo and took this Yehuda in question with another person, and the two spent a night at the prison of the Sahab Shorta. Then on Monday morning, the runners set out with Yehuda and the other guy for Cairo. The police beat Yehuda badly in Cairo and in Fustat at the doors of the synagogues. Yehuda remained under arrest, punished and degraded for days. State agents took 52 dinars from Yehuda, 50 dinars for his guards, and two for the head of the Shorta. Now, what happened here? Someone, perhaps Abu Khair himself, reported Yehuda ben Chaim to the police. The head of police then sent runners to Fustat to arrest Yehuda and bring him to the Sahaba Shorta's private prison. The following morning, the police beat Yehuda in, the, in public in the streets of Fustat and in front of, Fustat, of Cairo, excuse me, and in front of Fustat's main synagogues. They then returned Yehuda to his cell. In order to be freed, Yehuda had to pay a massive sum 52 dinars, over double the average yearly income of a Fustat Jewish family, to convince the officers to release him from prison. On what basis did the police act here? The police ostensibly acted to maintain public order. That is why Yehuda is tortured in the public sphere in front of his co-religionists. And yet, even after he is beaten, Yehuda is then thrown back in prison. Why? Most likely to solicit further bribes. In this case, the sums of the bribes are so massive that we must assume Yehuda was someone of means. Had he been poor, he would likely have remained incarcerated indefinitely, or at least until one of his family members or co-religionists bailed him out. Now, there is no reason to assume necessarily that Yehuda's viminess that is his state, his, uh, his belonging to a minority group, um, was necessarily the most salient variable for his treatment at the hands of the police here. It is possible that a Muslim subject in the same situation may have faced similar repercussions. That is because while Yehuda had caused a public disturbance, he had not struck at the foundations of the Islamic social order. On the other hand, when Vimis did usurp Muslim privileges, such as when a Jewish man slept with a Muslim woman, their treatment was in fact defined by their Dhimmi status. 
One example of such a case appears in an undated medieval Arabic petition to a minor official shown here. The fragmented document reads, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. The slave informs the exalted presence that Munajat Adawla raided the house of a Maghrabi Jewish merchant who was with a Muslim woman. They are now in the prison of the chief of police, Habs Shachabashwarta. Here then a state official, perhaps a member of the secret police based on his title, Munajat Adawla, found and arrested a Jewish merchant who had been with a Muslim woman in a private space in which they drank alcohol and may have had sexual relations. Both parties are brought to the police station. Had this been a Muslim man sleeping with a Jewish or Christian woman, no law would have been broken. But it was not permissible for men who belonged to minorities to sleep with women of the ruling majority. In medieval Egypt, as other masculine-centric societies, the penetration of the female body of the majority was a violation of the ruling community's superior status. The actions of the police here then are motivated by the anxieties and prejudices of their society's dominant group, in this context, Muslim males. Similar anxieties about Jews and Christians usurping other Muslim privileges and prerogatives are evident in a number of other contexts in the Geniza documents, including uh, cases in which Jews and Christians were prevented from holding certain types of public ceremonies, including funerals and weddings, in contexts in which Muslims judged that those funerals and weddings had been too ostentatious in their displays of the wealth or power. Now, restrictions on the building of large or particularly ostentatious synagogues and churches follow this same logic. As we'll see later in this talk, the perception that Vimis had gotten too big for their britches could incite popular violence, at times violence sanctioned by Muslim state actors. Now, the examples we've discussed up till now involved crimes of public disorder and sexual immorality, but the vast majority of Jews who were arrested in medieval Egypt had committed a very different kind of crime. Namely, they had failed to pay their taxes to the state. In the next part of this talk, we will discuss how carceral institutions, namely imprisonment and house arrest, were used as tools of economic extortion that targeted the most vulnerable members of Vimy communities and thereby compelled their co-religionists to pay extortionate sums to the state. Very little has been written on prisons in the pre-modern Islamic world perhaps because almost all prominent Muslim jurists reject the practice of punitive car incarceration, that is imprisonment specifically as a means of punishment and see it as contrary to Islam. Now, Islamic legal works do permit uh, detention before trials or the implementation of corporal punishments, what scholars call administrative detention. They also allowed limited use of quote unquote coercive detention. That is, for instance, imprisoning a wealthy individual to compel him or her to pay their debts. But as suggested above, the Shorta and other law enforcement institutions were rarely particularly interested in the prattlings of Islamic scholars and jurists. Arabic chronicles, biographical dictionaries, and travelers' accounts make clear that prisons were fixtures of the penal system in the medieval Islamic world. They are similarly prevalent in the documents of the Geniza. The most common form of punishment in Geniza documents is not detention in a brick and mortar prison, called a sijin, beit kele, or beit asurim in the letters, but rather house arrest, that is the situation in which a victim's home became their own personal prison. Most of the people who found themselves under house arrest were debtors who had failed to pay the capitation tax the jizya or jalia. The capitation tax was, according to Muslim theologians, supposed to be a progressive tax. That is, it was supposed to be proportional to the financial means of the individual dhimmi. This was rarely, if ever, true in practice in the Middle Ages, at least in medieval Egypt, the one place where we have the means to consistently document it. Instead, every Jewish and Christian adult male was taxed taxed at the rate of two dinars, about a month's salary for an average family. When Vimis were unable to pay the tax, they were thrown in jail, tortured, and were placed under house arrest. Once they entered the carceral system, their debts continued to accrue since they had to pay for the guards set over their homes or over their cells. The system thus made it nearly impossible for poor Vimis to escape poverty. Now, the most common genre of house arrest documents from the Geniza is the petition, 
that is, appeals from poor Jews to wealthy co-religionists, asking the latter's help to pay, back, pay their back taxes and thus free them from prison. This is one typical example. Um, you can see sort of the large uh, top margin, which is one indication of a, the petition genre. Um, this is, a, as you can see, a, a, a not um, a particularly impressive hand, but um, it, is, it is still a, a good example of this genre. Uh, on this slide, um, we see uh, the contents of that petition. In your name, O merciful one, the slave comes before the master, Sheikh Abu Sal, and kisses your hand and informs you that he has been well taken care of by the people. And he was happy until things fell apart and he became unemployed. He remained in that situation, as God Almighty knows, in want of everything. Here he switches from the third to the first person. And then the capitation tax assailed me and my status in every way. Today I have been imprisoned in my house for a period of 55 days. Here the writer describes how he, an otherwise productive member of society, had fallen on hard times and now no longer had the means to pay his capitation tax. As a result, he was imprisoned in his own home for almost two months and was forced to beg for funds from wealthy co-religionists to remove the edict of house arrest. In addition to house arrest and imprisonment, state agents also frequently used torture against the me tax evaders. Here's another example of this petition genre. Um, this again is a, uh, um, uh, it's fragmented, but um, it's a petition from a poor Jew beaten and imprisoned for not paying uh, the capitation tax. And this document means, uh, reads, I am of the people of Fusta, a poor man called Hiba ibn Zafran. I have never begged except this year alone as a result of the capitation tax. As the community and the judges know, I failed to pay the capitation tax on Friday, and I was savagely beaten for this, as witnessed by six virtuous Jewish notables, the Hebrew Ziknei Yosher from Cairo. In this case, then, the debtor is not immediately subjected to house arrest. Instead, he is first tortured in the public sphere. What is the purpose of this torture? It is performative. That is, it is for the consumption of its audience. The police beat the poor man in front of his elite co-religionists to both inspire fear among the poor and, more importantly, pity from the rich, the notables, who the police hope to inspire to pay the victim's back taxes. Now, failure to pay one's back taxes or even the taxes of one's family members could lead the means under house arrest to be thrown into formal prisons. This is evident from a letter from a man in Alexandria to his brother in Fustat. The writer states that he was under the Tarsim, here house arrest. And you can see this is a, quite a typical um, form of letter where um, the writer is continued in the margins on the right side here, unlike the uh, more formal petition um, genre that we've seen in previous um, examples. The letter reads, I remained under house arrest for two days. Then the Qadi became exasperated with me, threw me in prison. I remained one day and one night in prison. I found no way to get released from there except by paying what was owed. That is to say, what you owed. What happened in this scenario? First, the writer refused to pay his brother's capitation tax, which he was actually under, under no legal obligation to pay. Then the Qadi placed him, placed him under house arrest. However, after only two days, the Qadi became exasperated with our writer and threw him into a real brick and mortar prison. Numerous letters attest to the use of torture and food deprivation on the regular as means of treatment of the incarcerated in these prisons. The writer therefore decided quite reasonably to pay what was owed and was thus released. However, he was only able to do so because he was a physician as we find out later in this letter and therefore he could afford to pay this particular tax. A poor Jew or Christian in the same situation would have remained imprisoned indefinitely. Now, in addition to dozens of these types of letters about debtors in prison or under house arrest, the Geniza also preserves long charity lists of the poor who required support from wealthy co-religionists to pay their capitation tax. One of these lists shown here specifically indicates that all the poor whose names are enumerated in the list are under arrest. That is, they are in prison or under house arrest. The document opens, list of the prisoners. May God help to rescue them. The amount of each prisoner's remaining back taxes is then written next to their name. Medieval Egypt's debtor prison system may strike us modern day observers as absurd. After all, how was someone supposed to pay, repay their debt if they were trapped at home, couldn't work, and had to provide the salary for the very guard set over their home? 
then again, or their cell. Then again, our modern prison system is equally absurd if we are to judge its success according to its own purported claim to prevent recidivism, that is, the return of uh, prisoners to the prison system, since our prisons are, after all, filled with the previously incarcerated. On the other hand, if we judge both carceral systems as institutions primarily designed to perpetuate themselves, to define normative behavior, to uphold the social hierarchy, and at least in the medieval case, to extract revenue, then their efficacy is no longer in doubt. But what happened when the burden was too much and even the wealthy could not or would not pay the debts of the poor? Such a situation occurred in Alexandria in June of 1141, as we learn in a letter from a leading Alexandrian Jew, Abu Nasser ibn Ibrahim, to a colleague in Fustat. Now in the letter, Abu Nasser explains, I am under house arrest. This is the letter. Again, you can see uh, this form of, of, of the right margin in which um, this letter writer has continued um, uh, the portion of the letter. This is actually the second page of memory serves. Um, I am under house arrest, as is another Jewish leader, the Sheikh Abu Ali al-Baghdadi, and a number of other prominent Jews. I've already told you about the matter of hatreds, sin'ut, anti-Jewish sentiments or violence that are here in Alexandria. The Jews cannot be freed from the collection of the poll tax except through your help. And the writer then asks his, con his contact to petition Muslim officials, including the Wali of Alexandria, who is the Sahib Ashorta, in addition to his other responsibilities. Now the situation here is twisted for the hands of the common people have spread against the Jews. What happened here? The leading Jews of Alexandria were all put under house arrest because of debts from the Jizya that were not in fact their own. The money was owed by their far less, less fortunate Jewish neighbors. Now this action makes absolutely no sense according to Islamic law. Since the payment of the Jizya is supposed to be an individual rather than a communal obligation. However, as we've seen, the system of house arrest and indeed the imprisonment of the mean debtors, uh, debtors in general was in fact an extension of the institutions of state taxation and revenue extraction rather than of criminal justice. That is, the system was not a punitive one used to discourage criminals first and foremost, but a coercive one whose violence was performed first and foremost for the eyes of Vimy elites who could actually afford to pay to spare the prisoners from their travails. The second part of this letter brings us to the subject of popular violence, the third and final part of our talk. The writer here mentions Sinut, an anti-Jewish sentiment that spilled into violence. Exactly how the Sinut relates to tax imposition is unclear, but it clearly incentivized compliance with state demands. Abu Nasser hopes that state agents, the Qadi or the Sahib Ashorta, will intervene and restore order. And perhaps they did, but perhaps they didn't. In any case, the fact that they did not do so in the immediate aftermath of the events here suggests that the violence to this point had served there, and more to the point, the state which they represent, that state's interests. Episodes of Sinut occur, occur in over a half dozen other Geniza documents. Several other uh, similar documents also mention uh, mass arrests, or in one case, an entire community of Jews being threatened with death to coerce one Jewish position to treat a local Muslim ruler. Now, popular violence and mass arrest, arrests, sanctioned or permitted by the state, and at times inspired by collective sinut, were tools of group discipline. Now, the jizya was not the most frequent cause for such episodes. As we know from other contexts, anti-Vimmi popular violence most often arose in response to a Jew or Christian, for lack of a better term, being uppity. That is, claiming prerogatives that were supposed to be reserved for privileged Muslims. That could mean everything from a Vimy courtier rising too high in state power, which led to a massacre of Jews in 1066 in Granada, or a simply simple Vimy merchant sleeping with a Muslim woman, who may well and seems to have been a prostitute, as we see in our next and final document. Now, the latter episode took place in Alexandria in the late 11th or 12th century. At this time, a leader of, leader of Alexandria's Jews wrote to a leader of the Jews of Egypt in Fustat, uh, asking the latter to intervene with the caliph to stop public rioting in Alexandria. 
Um, this, again, as you can see, is in the form of a uh, petition, um, the more sort of formal structure that we saw uh, in the other documents in terms of the maintenance of margins and such. In the petition, the Alexandrian leader explains what inspired these riots. An act of subterfuge was committed against the distinguished leader of the Jewish community in one of the inns. He was detained with a worthless girl. The secret policeman spoke to the girl about the matter of unlawful sexual relations, Zina. Our slave came and said, I bear witness to the Qadi that the Jew raped you and then paid you for sleeping with him. When she arrived at the Qadi's courts, a thousand people followed in her wake and all of them bore witness and said, we came to the inn and the Jew was with her. But when the Qadi cross-examined them individually, he found there was no truth to any of their testimony. Nevertheless, secret police inspectors prevailed upon the Qadi, convincing him to go against his conviction. So anti-Jewish hatred reawakened among the people such as never had been seen before. Already this hatred has spread from one group to another, such that everyone in the city has become a market policeman, a muhtasib of the Jews. So what happened here? A secret policeman accused a Jewish elder of committing a crime, sleeping with a Muslim woman, most likely a prostitute, in a funduk, that is in an inn, a common site for prostitution. The Jew and the woman were subsequently arrested and detained at the inn. The secret policeman who discovered them brought to the woman's attention the implications of having fornicated with a non-Muslim. Perhaps he told her that the crime of zinna was in fact punishable by an execution. Subsequently, the Muslim woman's slave came and claimed that she had been in fact raped with the awkward addition of the statement that she had been paid for that. He would likely have known that if this were true, she still would have committed a crime by sleeping, even unwillingly, with a non-Muslim, but not a crime punishable by death. Now, rumors then spread about a Jew raping a Muslim woman, and more people came to confirm they had in fact witnessed this woman being violated. The Qadi found these claims specious, but pressure from the secret police and from the hundreds of observers who had gathered to egg him on forced him to rule that the, Jew, that the Jew was guilty. Following the guilty verdict, and perhaps the fornicator's imprisonment or execution, there was mass violence against Alexandria's Jews, which was still ongoing at the time of our letter's composition. In this chaos, our writer claims, all Muslims became muhtasibs for the Jews, empowered like the state market policemen to regulate Themi's behavior through state-sanctioned violence. Of course, the role of the state here is never made explicit as such, but there is no indication it acted to stop the violence. And quite to the contrary, the police officers had in fact done everything possible to instigate it. What is clear is that during this conflict, the prerogatives of law enforcement and state violence devolved to members of the privileged majority who acted violently in response to a minority's assumed violation of the Islamic social hierarchy. The modern parallels of such informal majority policing of minority uh, communities are simply too numerous to enumerate. Now, we modern people tend to think that both our successes and our failures are either sui generis or unique and or rooted in our immediate past. For instance, cutting edge works on America's racial problems contextualize anti-Black state violence in a specifically American context rooted in a specific racist discourse from our country's relatively recent past. There are, of course, innumerable merits to this framework of identifying immediate antecedents to racist violence in our society. However, state violence that disproportionately targets minorities and ideologies that justify such violence are neither new nor unique to modern America. They are endemic to societal hierarchies in countless human contexts. Today, I have endeavored to show how state violence preserved a social hierarchy rooted in religious difference in one particular medieval Islamic society. These Jewish documents have allowed us to see how in medieval in Egypt, the institutions of law enforcement used violence to prevent non-Muslims from usurping perceived Muslim prerogatives and privileges. These policies cost untold lives and livelihoods. They inflicted incalculable suffering, but the institutions of the penal system here did not function alone. They did so through popular support and when need be, popular violence. In other words, such policies were and are only possible when justified by the anxieties and animosities 
of the majority. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for this fascinating talk uh, and this fascinating dip inside the Geniza. Uh, you spent all this time, two years, looking at Geniza documents. And uh, you mentioned in your, in, your, in your talk, you looked at over 200 of them. This is a very, really rich talk. And I want to ask you some questions also uh, about this. Before, before I do that, I, I want to moderate uh, the Q&A for the audience. So I look forward to your questions. To the audience, please think and post your questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of every, everyone's screen. Uh, apologies in advance if you run out of time to answer everyone's um, questions. Let me have a quick look. Okay, actually, I'm going to build off of the last question that uh, Noam Pianko just, just asked, asked, which is what is the most surprising unexpected item you found in the Geniza? And I hope Noam doesn't mind, I'm just going to attach my question onto it, which was something I was thinking also. You spent two years looking at the Geniza. So to us scholars outside of the Geniza, you know, we're somewhat familiar with it in a peripheral way. It informs our studies because it has so much importance as, a, as an archive. But having spent this close time with the Geniza, what was something that was surprising or unexpected that you can offer us about this archive and its importance to historians in different fields? Great questions. I mean, I, I, I think one of the most surprising things I found, and I actually just gave a talk on this, was the use of informal spaces as sites of incarceration. So um, when I first came to the project, I sort of, I, I had the biases that we have as modern Americans thinking about formal prisons as mm. primary, primarily the sites where people were incarcerated. But in reality, um, you saw here that the prison of the of the Saha Peshorta, of the chief of police, for lack of a better term. Um, we also have all these other sort of private um, prisons. Uh, and we also have people's homes becoming their own private prisons. We have funduks used as prisons. We have government offices used as prisons. And I think what was most striking to me were the parallels to uh, modern private prisons, which is that uh, these are these are primarily um, a, 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 one might say pre-capitalist, but still profit-oriented uh, series of institutions that um, benefited the people who ran them. Um, and there's something bizarrely modern about that notion that um, uh, you know, that, that the, basically the system, even though it was formerly a state institution, um, uh, first and foremost benefited um, the private actors who were, you know, in theory, working on behalf of the state. Now, Tom Nicocelli, I hope I pronounced that correctly, asked a question kind of related to what you just said. He said, regarding the capitation tax home arrest, how did they enforce that in those years? Meaning, who would monitor and how? What if the Jews left their house arrest undercover uh, for example. And I just want to add to that also a question that I, I was thinking also, which is that in addition to the Geniza, what other types of sources, what other types of evidence were you looking at to get a sense of these institutions, for example, the private prisons that you mentioned? Great. Um, uh, so in terms of like how, um, how the actual process of house arrest worked beyond the fact that we know that guards were posted at the doors, there's, there's a lack of clarity. What's clear is people did still leave their houses. So these were, I mean, in the same ways mm -hmm. today, if you think about it, we have people with, um, of anger, course. right? That, right. that monitor their, their uh, uh, movements um, when they're under, uh, it, you know, when they're imprisoned outside of uh, prisons. Um, so how did they enforce this? So first off, there were actually guards who checked that they came back to their house. But again, I think the way to understand this is to understand the ways in which these people functioned in a communal and uh, familial context in which basically those family members and their community were held hostage as a means to coerce them to pay. So uh. um, because there could be collective punishment, you could flee, and we do have examples of people fleeing, for instance, their debts, um, but then often their wife and children, for instance, um, get thrown in prison instead. Um, and uh, one of my favorite letters from the Geniza is actually, um, it's from the Crusader States, it's actually from a, a, a European uh, lord, but he's basically just adopted the existing um, Islamic prison system in Palestine. And he, the, the letter is from a father-in-law to his son-in-law. Uh, and he basically says, you know, you're a worthless piece of crap because you left your wife and child, which is to say his daughter and grandson, um, and they've been thrown into prison for your debts. So that kind of thing happens um, uh, not infrequently. Um, so that's sort of the, the ways in which the enforcement mechanisms could work effectively, even a society that didn't have the same uh, sort of ability to observe people that we think of um, today. And Hamza, your, your second question was, oh, other sources. Yes. 
how do you fill in the holes? So you have a sense, okay, there were private prisons, people were held up in these different locations. What other sources can you bring in or were you able to bring in other sources uh, to enrich your understanding of the Geniza documents? Yeah, so that's actually sort of the next part of my project that I'm really excited about is looking more at Arabic chronicles. I have two colleagues at Vanderbilt, um, Mohammed al who I mentioned, and Taryn Marashi, both of whom are working on um, these sort of chronicle accounts, the literary sources. Um, and their research has been fascinating. The focus is very, very different than mine. So chronicle accounts tend to focus on, uh, you know, elite viziers who get thrown um, into prisons because those kinds of characters are much more compelling for a literary text. Um, but there's also things like um, uh, that Taryn just gave a fantastic presentation on popular riots um, that freed prisoners, for instance, in Baghdad. Oh. So um, that said, Jews and Christians are almost never the subjects of interest in those contexts, again, because that's not the audience that they were writing for. But it's really important work that they're doing and it's really important for me. Um, I, I've done some of sort of started that research, but looking at the Arabic chronicles, and thinking about the ways in which uh, those literary texts actually um, can contextualize or, or not our understanding um, of the system. And it's just shocking how little work has actually been done on this so far. So all of it sort of is, there's a lot of uh, 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 mining that has to be done to really figure these things out. So Brendan, I mean, looking at these Geniza documents, I imagine they also tell us a lot about the Christian and the Muslim experience of state violence and incarceration. Um, do you, did you find in these, in those accounts, I mean, well, I guess the first question is, do they exist? And if they do exist, then can we say how distinct were the experiences of state violence across religious communities versus uh, class divisions? So were the lower class urban Christian population or Muslim population experiencing state violence or the incarceration, the various mechanisms of, incar of, incar of incarceration in similar ways or no, there were fundamentally different experiences based on your um, religious grouping, majority or minority? That, that's a great question. Um, so the truth is we can't comment or I can't comment in the way that I can on Jewish experiences of, of incarceration on Muslim experiences uh, specifically. So there are, so I actually had a, a document there that I showed one of the early Arabic documents. I showed the first one. Um, that's actually a, a, uh, an issue of, uh, it's incredible. I don't know if anything else exists like this. Tamara Lathy and Marina Rusto found it. It's a, um, it's just a list of, of orders, uh, probably from the Safa Bashorta to um, a policeman uh, basically saying, these are the people you need to arrest. Um, and oh, what is- wow raped a woman, one is someone who, um, my favorite is actually two of them are both people who like made fun of public officials who you now need to like go and, um, so those are, those are non uh, 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 Jewish actors who are thrown in prison. And, and there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, Muslim, uh, Muslim debtors had, uh, had a similar experience of incarceration when they, when they fell into debt. The point I was making with this presentation with the focus on the jizya, the jalia, the, the poll tax that was specifically incumbent on non-Muslims is that tax was so onerous that we see in the course of the Geniza documents that the vast majority of people who are in prison, the vast majority of Jews are in prison specifically for debts that were accrued in the course of not being able to pay that tax. That's very important. Hmm. Yeah, and, and that I think there's no reason to assume that Christians would have experienced that differently. The, Christian, the Coptic population by this period tended to be more concentrated in the countryside, but again, even there, um, the collection of the Jizya, the Jalia also uh, functioned similarly, and they were in many cases even poorer. So um, we, okay. I, I, I'm unaware of any sort of comparable documents that would show us what the Christian experience was. But again, I think, I think we can reasonable, reasonably extrapolate from the Jews experience uh, to talk about uh, how Christians would have experienced it. Similar socioeconomic position. Uh, so now I wanna ask uh, Professor Ahuvia, Mika Ahuvia's question, very important question, were women imprisoned according to the Cairo Geniza texts? And under, if so, under what circumstances? Great question. I just gave a talk on this actually. Um, and I could have actually answered this to Noam's question, what I was most surprised by, although in retrospect, I shouldn't have been surprised, uh, was how few women um, appear as prisoners in these, in these documents. I mentioned um, there are cases in which women are arrested because their husbands have um, failed to pay mm. uh, their debt. Um, so that's one situation in which women appear in prison. Um, there are a few women who are imprisoned for reasons that we can't identify. So I found about five documents, which is, which is nothing compared to this larger corpus that deal with imprisoned women. However, what I found that was much more interesting, uh, to me at least, was um, all of these men sending letters to their sisters, first and foremost, but also mothers, 
who had the financial means to get them out of prison and begging. Uh. And what's fascinating about these letters and tells you something about the construction of gender in medieval Egypt is these are the most detailed letters in terms of laying out how torture and um, uh, food deprivation and all these things actually worked because they're, 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 they seem to assume that females will be more open to an emotional appeal. And so it's, it's, this, um, uh, it's in these letters actually that we often get sort of the most disturbing but also rich accounts of people's treatment uh, in the prison system. Which is what makes the Geniza such a fascinating archive because it allows insight into these dimensions historically. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Which are otherwise so hard to access for historians. Um, now, Mika Huvi also has another question, which I think is interesting. Do Jewish letters ever allude to the, bio, the biblical Joseph's time in prison as a precedent? Do these sources reference these larger kind of interpretive traditions of the Hebrew Bible, et cetera? A absolutely. So there, there are a few references um, to figures uh, rising out of the prison like Joseph. So this idea of like, if you free me, I could become this figure like the biblical Joseph, who after he was, of course, freed from incarceration, became uh, um, the second in command or whatever to Pharaoh in Egypt, or however one reads those passages. Um, we also have, I mentioned one of the terms that's used for prisons is beta sorim, which is um, also the term used in the book of Exodus. Um, mm. And what's interesting is, uh, that, that document that I, that, that I, there are a couple of documents where that happens, but one is actually by a European Jew who finds himself in Cairo, seemingly has no idea that, what the capitation tax is, has no money on him, can't pay it, um, and hides in a local Jew's house. Um, and he talks about his fear of being thrown into the Beit HaSurim. So it's interesting to have this European Jew who finds himself in Egypt and imagines uh, 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 <laughs> the, the, the prison of the biblical Joseph. So um, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, Joella has a question, Brendan, which is, uh, well, you could tell us, where are the physical Geniza documents is that you were studying, Geniza documents that you were studying located? Uh, do any of them remain in Egypt and Cairo? Great question. So um, as is the case for a lot of um, uh, documentary troves that were removed in the course of colonialism, um, the, the Geniza documents uh, have actually spread um, throughout the world. They're in over a dozen different libraries, maybe closer to two dozen. Um, what's happened is there, there was a project um, that called the Friedberg Geniza Project that's actually digitized all of the documents outside of a uh, collection in St. Petersburg, um, where we still just have um, uh, slides. Um, but outside of that, we actually have high resolution digital images of um, almost all the documents. Um, so even though they are scattered throughout the world and none as far as I know are still in Egypt, um, they are now accessible to scholars um, as a single corpus uh, because of this work in, of digitization. The, the documents that you were looking at, did you see any of them physically or did you work with them di on, as digital images? So I worked with them as digital images, but when I say high resolution, I mean, you can literally look at the, it's, it's, it's better than the human eye. I mean, you can yeah. look, at so if you know Hebrew and you're trying to figure out, is that a Dalit or a Reish, yes. right? And like, I think there's something like sticking out this way that makes it look like a Dalit, like you can like zoom in and, and it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's something that, I mean, I, I have had the privilege of holding a few of the documents um, uh, because they were stored at Princeton while I was there. Huh. Uh, but uh, which is amazing. I mean, it's incredible. Of course, yes. To be able to touch the documents, but but honestly, as a as a scholar um, trying to read them, it's actually I would say even easier to do so um, in with the high resolution images than it would be with the physical documents. As you were working on your doctoral project, when you were stepping into this postdoc, this research fellowship at Princeton, where you going you were going to work be working with these Geniza documents, you already did you already have a sense of this the ocean that you're about to enter? How did you chart it out in order to extract from it these 200 documents that were meaningful for your question? Yeah, I no, I had um so you know, my first project is on the Crusader States. Um, I would say the book is based on about 60 documents. So when I started, I thought, okay, how do I create? Hmm. I, I assume there would be a similar corpus um for uh, uh, documents related to prison. And I just started working and the corpus just grew and grew and grew. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I, and again, I think that speaks to the fact that, 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 I mean, it's hard to overstate how prevalent incarceration, uh, um, uh, and, and, and state violence in these different contexts is in terms of oh. just, just, it, it's just a, a, a very large corpus. I mean, 200 Let's... documents. 
by medieval huh. standards is huge. Um, right, it's huge, but, but you found them. <laughs> and, and, and it's growing. Yeah. I mean, I just added about 20 documents because I started working on, um, on, the, on the police um, and not looking specifically at imprisonment necessarily. And, um, and that added a whole nother set of things. Um, so there are, um, I have no doubt that, it, that, that that corpus will continue to grow. Okay. Um, um, uh, Dr. Goldman, Brendan, thank you for this really, really rich talk. We've learned a lot. Um, I'm sorry to all of those who've posted questions in the Q&A that I, I could not get around to. We have to be um, wrapping up. Thank you everyone for joining us again. Thank you, Dr. Brendan Goldman. Uh, the Strom Center is also happy to co-sponsor the Sephardic Mizrahi Spotlight at the 2021 Seattle Jewish Film Festival. Dr. Goldman will be speaking at the screening of From Cairo to the Cloud, which is a film about the Cairo Geniza, which he and I were just talking about. Save the date for the 2021 Strom Lecture with Julia Watts Belser, which will also take place online. We will now end the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. Take care. Awesome.